what's up? Meatloaf is, um, it's a hard recipe to get excited about. Until now. Today, I'm gonna show you how to make a meatloaf from scratch that I think is pretty exceptional. It doesn't fall apart or get greasy when you bake it, and it has an above average amount of the glazy, ketchupy crust that we all want. Get excited. Here we go. To get started, I'm gonna preheat a medium saute pan over medium heat. Once that's hot, in goes a long squiz of olive oil and then a whole diced large white onion or about 150 grams. I've opted to give this onion a small dice because in the end, it's gonna be inside of the meatloaf and the larger pieces will probably stand out texturally in a way that isn't ideal. I'll hit these onions with salt, then stir to combine with the oil and let them fry for five to six minutes until they're softened and starting to take on some color like this. From there, I'll scoot these onions over into a medium bowl to cool down, I'll set that aside and then I'll grab my food processor and into it measure 75 grams of panko breadcrumbs. The lid goes on and now I'll spin these up to break them down from a crummy texture into a little bit more of a powdered one. This is gonna make them easier to incorporate what comes next. That's 85 grams of buttermilk. I'll pour that in and now I'll give everything a spin to get the breadcrumbs hydrated. And after about 10 seconds or so, we're there. This mixture is called a panade and it's an old school cooking method for keeping meats moist and tender. And I always use one for meatloaf and meatballs. Once the panade is made, I'll drop in one pound or 450 grams of 90-10 ground beef and one pound or 450 grams of 90-10 ground pork. In my opinion, a 100% beef meatloaf is always a little bit dry. Dry, no matter how much panade you use, I think the pork lubes it up and gives it a little bit more flavor. Next, I'm gonna use my food processor to both spin the panade and the meats together to combine and to break the ground meats down just a little bit more. Spinning the meat extra like this works the proteins in the meat to keep them more sticky and keeps the overall meatloaf more well bound together. After 15 seconds, the panade is mixed in and the meats look a little bit more like sausage. Be careful not to work it more than this though, because if we go much further, it would get kind of snappy like a hot dog when you cooked it and that would be weird. Now I'll flip this meat mixture over into the onion bowl and then add in two large eggs and one egg yolk. Thanks to Cook's Country for the idea on the egg yolk, by the way, that added fat really makes a pretty big difference. Then in goes three large cloves that have given a really fine mince. Of course, you could also use a garlic press or even a microplane to break down that garlic. Then I'll add in 15 grams of Worcestershire, 15 grams of Dijon mustard, two grams of poultry seasoning. Yes, that seems weird, but it's pure nostalgia. Trust me, it really works. And then three grams of black pepper and 12 grams of salt. Now I'll jump into the bowl and mix everything together. Again, from this point on, we really don't wanna work the meat too much more. So I'm gonna be gentle and fold things just until they get evenly combined. Once everything's mixed together, I'm gonna to plop this over into a loaf pan. I'm not gonna be baking this inside of the loaf pan, but I am gonna use it to shape it into something relatively rectangular. Doing this freeform can be a little bit tricky. Also, baking meatloaf in a loaf pan only allows for glaze on the top, which is a huge mistake in my opinion. I need as much glazed crust around this loaf as possible. To get that crust, I'm gonna flip this out onto a sheet tray lined with aluminum foil. God, that looks terrible, but it is evenly distributed now, so I'm gonna zhuzh this into a proper meatloaf shape. As you can see, that involves a little bit of squashing and squishing and rotating the tray, and if there's gaps in the loaf, use your fingers just to pinch them back together and smooth them out the best you can. By the way, a really handy tool if you wanna shore things up on the sides and ends is a bread dough scraper. The straight sides there provide a kind of temporary pan that you can use to press things up against. And there we go. You really can't call this thing anything but a loaf of meat, that's for sure. It's not the prettiest thing ever, but this style of shaping is gonna give us so much crust. For now, I'm gonna chill this loaf before I cook it in the fridge and make sure to put it right on top of some raw spinach that you're gonna be eating later on for lunch. That's safe. While that chills, I'm gonna preheat my broiler to medium low and then I'm gonna make the glaze for this meatloaf. For that, into a saucepan, I'll combine 60 grams of brown sugar, 40 grams of cider vinegar, 10 grams of Worcestershire, 20 grams of sriracha, or any hot sauce would work here, and then finally 300 grams of ketchup. I'll give it a stir to combine and that's it. This might seem like a lot of glaze for just one meatloaf, and it is, but I'm gonna be triple glazing this little BB. Once the broiler's preheated and my loaf has had a chance to chill down, I'm gonna load it into the oven and get it seared. That's gonna take about five to 10 minutes. When I check back, you can see the top of the loaf is sizzling and it's taking on some great color. When you sear meat before glazing, you're not only getting good flavorful caramelization on top, but you're priming the meat for the glaze. The glaze sticks way better to cooked crusty meat. Speaking of glaze, I'm going to lacquer on my first coat. As you can see, I'm being very liberal. Don't be shy because in my opinion, meatloaf is really only exciting when the rich meaty interior has plenty of acidity and caramelized sweetness on the exterior to bring contrast. In total, I'm layering on 
maybe a quarter to a third cup of glaze. And once it's covered, I'm gonna load this back under the broiler to cook for another three minutes or so. Once that's reduced to the point of stickiness and it's starting to take on some color like this, I'm gonna pull it out, lacquer it up a second time, then load it back into the oven to repeat the reduction and caramelization. During round two, I'm gonna rotate this tray a few times to make sure that all the sugar that's on top isn't getting burnt. When I pull this loaf after round two, you can see that now we're getting properly glazed up. To finish cooking this, I'm gonna turn my oven down to 325F 160C, and then I'm gonna add one more coat of ketchup onto the loaf. This time though, I'm not gonna be broiling that on. The coat is gonna slowly glaze as the loaf cooks at 325. Now I'm gonna load this loaf into the oven one more time and bake it for 25 to 35 minutes. And I'll thank the sponsor of this video, Helix Sleep. Helix Sleep makes premium mattresses and bedding that are customized to fit your needs. And conveniently, they ship this stuff right to your door. The way it works is simple. You take a personalized sleep quiz to see what kind of sleeper you are. I'm a back sleeper. I prefer a firm mattress and a sleep with a partner, Lorne. And we both love a firm bed. We got the Dawn Lux mattress, and already I like it way more than the generic foam one that we used to have. The Dawn sleeps way cooler than that mattress. It's way more supportive, and overall, it's just comfy, which is exactly what you want in a mattress. If you're worried about buying a mattress that you haven't slept on, Helix gives you 100 nights to sleep on it to see if you like it. If you don't, they pick it up and give you a full refund. This mattress also comes with a 10-year warranty, and if you wanted, there's financing options available as well. So to try Helix, click the link in my description and get $200 off your first mattress plus two free pillows. Lauren really loves the pillows. Help yourself to get better sleep. The link is in my description. $200 off your mattress. Thanks, Helix Sleep. Before I check back on my loaf, I'm going to take the remaining ketchup glaze. There should be about a cup and a half, and I'll throw it on the stove to reduce by about 50%. That should take about three to four minutes over medium-low heat. I'll stir it frequently, though, because, you know, heat and sugar that could burn. And once we're reduced by about half, now we've got a very concentrated, sweet and sour and savory condiment to eat with our meatloaf. I'll set that aside. Speaking of things to eat with your meatloaf, now would be a good time to start some mashed potatoes. And if you came from Northern Illinois, like me, Illinois, I just said Illinois. I'm from Illinois. Now would be the time to start some onion gravy. The potatoes themselves are pretty self-explanatory, so I won't go into detail, but for the onion gravy, I'll preheat a 10 inch saute pan over medium heat. I'll add in 50 grams of butter and about 100 grams of diced onions. I'll salt the onions so that they lose their moisture and then I'll sweat this in the butter for five minutes to soften everything up. From there, I'll add in 25 grams of all-purpose flour. I'll whisk that in and then I'll cook that for three to five more minutes or until any rawness is cooked out of the flour. Next, I'll add in 100 grams of beef stock. I've got 450 grams to go in in total, but you do need to add the stock in stages so that things don't get clumpy. Once that's stirred in and starting to get thick, I'll add in the rest of the stock. I'll stir that to combine and bring it up to a simmer. Lastly, I'll add in 10 grams of beef flavored better than bouillon paste and a splash of soy sauce, about five grams. I'll simmer everything together until things get thickened and the onions are fully tender, maybe about five more minutes. And there we go, a thick but not too thick onion gravy for my potatoes and my meatloaf. This gravy tastes like a 3D version of the powdered stuff that my mom used to heat up for our meatloaf. Obviously it's more flavorful though and the texture is a lot better and it's surprisingly easy to make. I'll set that aside until I need it. Now, after about 30 minutes of baking, I'm gonna pull this loaf out of the oven and check it for doneness. 155F 70C seems to be the sweet spot for texture, much higher and things start to get a little bit toothsome and a little bit dry. The exterior of this loaf looks so ridiculous too. It's been triple glazed and the meat itself has some nice dark roastiness to it. And I think you can see how juicy this is from the outside. It's a beautiful log of meat. But I do need to rest this though, just like I would for a steak. The juices would all run out everywhere if we didn't, so I'm gonna tent this with foil and leave it to sit here for about 20 minutes. 20 minutes later, I'm gonna come back to slice this up. It should still be very hot, but fully rested and fully juiced up. Now, when I cut into it, you can see just how juicy this actually is. Clearly, it's a far cry from the greasy, grainy meatloafs of our childhood. Instead, the combo of buttermilk, panade, and the blend of beef and pork come together to make a meatloaf that is just so much better than good. It's actually great. And it's so, so juicy. Oh my God, look at this. Now to make this into a proper blue plate special, I'll lay down a couple of thick slices of my meatloaf, then a huge dollop of creamy, buttery whipped mashed potatoes. I'll link in the description to a few recipes of mine for mashed potatoes, by the way. Then of course, I'll drop in some green peas to get all smushed up with the potatoes, then a huge ladle of onion gravy. You guys, that's textbook mom right there. Like this image could sell a TV dinner. The last touch for me is to dollop just a little bit of that reduced ketchup glaze right onto the loaf and now you're set up dude so the next time it's cold outside and you're feeling a little bit blue 
Bake yourself a log of comfort meat. This one is super easy to make and it hits so hard. I really hope you guys try it. Let's eat this thing.